I've titled the message this morning, How to Thrive in 2020. How to Thrive, I know. <laughs> it makes me chuckle too, you know, because a lot of what we hear, right, we know that we're in a crazy year. In fact, I saw someone post something that said, you know, I'm going to go ask my mom if I can take her up on that promise to uh, smack my backside into next year. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, and like, how, how can we get out of 2020? You know, and, you know, we, we came into it, and not to bring up bad memories, but in a pretty crazy political season, which it's been for quite some time. And, and that was uh, taking a toll on, on a lot of folks, understandably. And then in March, about, you know, we started this thing called the coronavirus. And then all these measures to uh, attempt to help with that. And a lot of difficulty from the attempt to help with that, right? The, the shutdown and, and just, uh, you know, the virus itself, of course, being uh, problematic, dangerous, and then the, the response uh, in various ways in various communities causing all sorts of challenges. And then if that wasn't enough, right, we have civil unrest, not had, have civil unrest. And Part of what the Lord has led us in, in as part of this YouTube ministry is a new playlist. And you'll see on there they have, think of it, books, I guess. Uh, so playlists, we're, we're going to start one called What About Truth? And we're going to talk about current events in light of truth. Because sometimes that misses. I don't know if you realize that. Sometimes the truth misses from some of the narratives being promoted. And so we want to be a part of the conversation and, and it's cool you know and you know if you're like me you might think at first you know hey Steve I know all these you know great pastors and speakers who have hundreds of thousands of subscribers and and they're getting the word out and that's absolutely true and I'm so grateful for that and I follow and that's one of the cool things I didn't know this about YouTube <laughs> I didn't know a lot about YouTube uh, just like Facebook live before this started but you know it's similar to Facebook where you can have people that you follow and Hear, hear from in different news sources, some that perhaps more reliable than what might be on the airwaves or what have you. And so it's kind of cool, but as we've talked about before here at Calvary Chapel, right, um, we all have a sphere of influence. And so, you know, some folks, you think of the Greg Lauries of the world, one of my favorite preachers, and I know I say that a lot, but, but uh, uh, has a radical sphere of influence. But there's people that, that Greg Laurie can't reach, right? That, to a neighbor and, and, the, and, you know, or in a workplace and, you know, Pastor Chuck and his ongoing legacy and, and, you know, all sorts of folks, you know, well-spoken folks that talk about current events, but that people that you and I interact with may never hear of, may never uh, uh, have the opportunity to learn from. Well, we can be a part of that. And just like it's true physically, right, it's also true digitally. And so we can be a part of helping to spread that message by being involved in, with, with YouTube. It's by subscribing and sharing and, and everything. So it's an exciting time to, to think of what God is doing. And that's why I want to talk a little bit from these two chapters, 2 Kings chapter 6 and 7, about not only surviving 2020, but thriving. I know we're past the halfway mark, right? In fact, now we're pretty well past the halfway mark, almost to the fourth quarter, not quite, it's within sight. And, um, but I want to suggest that God is radically, I remember standing right here before we all got back together or, or, or before we started having live services again. And, uh, you know, I would get up close to the camera sometimes and chat. And I remember talking about uh, really sensing that God is, is, is radically at work today. You know, doing some things that we may not understand in the near future. But I, I, I become even more convinced of that truth of the move of God's Spirit uh, in, in the world, frankly, certainly in our nation and in, and in our lives. So, how to thrive in 2020. Let's pick it up in the first few verses here of chapter 6. And, and we've seen last week how God often works supernaturally, naturally. We saw what could be described as nothing short of 
radical miracles just in the normal course of life, right? And, and it's great if, you know, on national tonight, we could all see people be raised from the dead. You would think everybody will believe. Guess what? They wouldn't. <laughs> right? In fact, that's going to happen in the future, right? Two witnesses are going to be killed before the entire world. And you think about it, certainly when the Bible was written, but go back even 100 years, it's like, oh, the whole world. How could the whole world see two people die and raise from the dead? Well, this little thing called the Internet that nobody thought of 2,000 years ago, except the Lord knew about it, or, or even, you know, 100 years ago. I mean, I don't know when television came about, but, but uh, uh, certainly now capabilities. And, and so we know that's going to happen, and it's going to harden people's hearts. The, the reality is, I mentioned that, is that the reality is most ministry happens and many miracles happen in just the ordinary course of life. Get up in the morning and we, we do what God's called us to do, right? And, uh, you know, for some of us, that might be like raising the dead, right? You know, but, but uh, just in, in the normal course of life, God does his thing. So let's check out here in verse 1. Now the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See the place where we dwell under your charge is too small for us. Uh, go to Jordan, or, or excuse me, let us go to the Jordan, and each of us get there a log, and let us make a place for us to dwell there. Now, now this speaks to the impact of Elisha's ministry. Right? The, the, these are uh, people that he's teaching, right? the sons of the prophets, the, the students, and uh, the, the ministry, the school, if you will, is growing so uh, wonderfully there's not room for them. And so, you know, they don't go petition uh, Elisha and, you know, the state to build more schools. They go to Elisha and they say, hey, look, it's too small. How about if we go build the school and make more space for all of those? And verse, uh, and he answered there at the end of verse 2, go. All right, go. Then one of them said, be pleased to go with your servants. And he answered, I'll go. So it's, th there's a need, right? And the students, rather than expecting someone else to take care of it for them, understandably ask permission because he's, Elisha's the leader. But they say, hey, there's a need here. We need more room, right? For a very good reason because the school's growing. How about if we build more space to house everybody? And Elisha says, all right, you know, go do it. And they say, and wisely, they say, hey, well, will we come with us? They want his, his, his presence, his blessing there. And so he went with them, verse 4, and they came to the Jordan, and they cut down trees. But as one was felling a log, his axe head fell into the water. So, you, you know, you can understand this isn't like uh, some of us, present company included, uh, the week of the derecho, right? The, remember the winds? Some places up to 140 miles an hour. Uh, Who ever heard of a derecho in Iowa before that? But anyways, as a result of that, many of us had, had the opportunity to get out and cut up trees, right? You know, my neighbors, the second, the night afterwards, we had some bad uh, tree damage to the tree. Thank God, no damage to any homes or property like that. But um, get out there with our chainsaws. It's actually kind of fun. <laughs> if, if, you know, if, if, if we're honest, we get out there and, cut up logs, and, you know, thank God some of the guys had more experience. It's like, I don't cut that way because the branch is going to fall on, on you or whatever, and here's how you do it. And, and, uh, but not so for Elisha and the young men. They didn't have, you know, Husqvarna or, or Poulan Pro or whatever chainsaw. They were swinging axe heads, right? To, to, you know, the effort was a lot. The chainsaw was a lot easier, you know, and so... These guys are swinging their axe, and the axe head flies off into the river. And, and it was made of iron, and iron wasn't uh, widely in, in uh, use at the time. It was expensive. And more importantly, as he says here, alas, my master, it was borrowed. So he cries out. He's troubled because he's borrowed this relatively expensive piece of, of equipment. 
and, and understandably wants to do the right thing and, and bring it back, working, and now it's in the river. And so uh, the man of God said, well, where did it fall? That, that's Elisha. And when he showed him the place, he, that is Elisha, cut off a stick and threw it in there and made the iron flow. Interesting, right? You're asking, why did he do that? We don't know. Nobody knows <laughs> why the stick. People might have different thoughts. But there's no, we're not really told what about this other than it was a point of faith made it float, and he said, take it up. And so he, now that is the student, reached out and picked up the iron off the top of the water. And all sorts of folks will, will try to come up with, uh, you know, well, actually, he took the branch and put a fishing line, and that's not what the Bible says, right? This is a miracle. God honored his faith of tossing out that branch, and he made iron float. And I don't have any problem with that, right? No problem for God, right? When, when he came on the form of Jesus, he himself walked on water. No problem there. So this is just a miracle in the normal course of life. What is our takeaway? I'm glad you asked. How can we apply this to our life in 2020 today where we want to see God move, right? In fact, I would suggest we need to see God move. Our first point from this section is work hard to do what you can do and trust God to do what only God can do. Many people sit back and want God to do it all, right? Or maybe want others to do it all. I love the fact that this student didn't, as I mentioned, ask for someone to build a bigger building. They said, hey, let's go build a bigger building. Elisha said, go do it, right? Elisha didn't, you know, he approved it, which, which is the responsibility of the leader. But they went out and they did it under his, under his kind of distant direction, you know. And in the course of that, and distant, not necessarily space-wise, but, you know, they had, they, from all we can tell, right, he wasn't like directly in charge of organizing every single step, right, which a good leader would just kind of oversee. And so, um, Work hard to do what you can do and trust God to do what only he can do. They went out. They were cutting logs. They made the plans to build the housing facility for the students. And in the course of their normal day, this uh, unfortunate event happens. One of the students loses this piece of equipment. And God miraculously intervenes, right? blesses Elisha's faith and but even in that I mean he could have had the axe had appear in the hand of the student he could have had it appear in the hand of the of Elisha but he said go get him right and I like that so often because because faith is a is, is an action word right it's a walk of obedience to obeying what God has revealed to us in his word and then trusting him with the outcome, right? The, the student couldn't by himself cause Isaac had to raise. In fact, there's no indication that he expected Elisha to do what he did. He just told Elisha. But God intervened, right? As only God could do. And so um, it's important for us to be in tune with what God wants to do, right? To be doing what we can do. As we've talked about before, pray as if it all depends upon God. And what is it? Life in 2020, right? Life in general. Pray as if it all depends upon God and work as if it all depends upon you. Right? We, we, we're, we're called to be a part of this work of the ministry, right? A lot of times people want to go into the ministry and they forget the work of part, right? You know, and so the work of, and I would say ministry just in terms of life, right? That, that we all collectively have the blessing to be a part of. So work hard to do what you can do and trust God to do what only he can do. And the reality is, right, in, in 2020, as, as we've all experienced together, 
it's changed course. Right? I was reading about um, a, a, a insurance industry political action committee I'm a part of, and how you know certain defined priorities going into 2020 that are radically changed. <laughs> Just like a lot of us with our life, right? It kind of made me pause to think. Yeah, that's true. Right? We all had certain plans going into 2020 vision. Oh, it's going to be a great year. How's that working out? You know what I mean? And so work hard as we can to do what we can do, but trust the Lord to do what only he can do. And then we'll see as we jump into the next section that faith, right? Faith requires that we see life through the lens of the Lord, right? We see life through the lens of God because this gives us a healthy perspective. When we look at 2020, we can get all bogged down with the many, many challenges and and what I believe is the hard work that lies ahead of us, right? If we're going to come through this as a a united nation, right, uh, there's a lot of work to do. There's real issues to to deal with. Uh, uh, Many aren't being dealt with properly, in my opinion, and and we'll talk about that in our our, our new series, but, um, and we talk about from time to time here, but there, there, there's work to do, but a lot of it has to do with, with doing the right thing, surrendering to the Lord. He's, he said himself, God says in Micah, he has shown you a man what is good and what does the Lord require of you to do justly, which is to do the right thing. That would change our country, wouldn't it? If everybody did the right thing, not because of, of um, you know, the example that we have in, you know, our local and state governments, Right, but do the right thing out of surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ because it's the right thing, right? To do justly, to love mercy, to be merciful. I mean, way before even the current times, it seems like many people don't listen to learn, they listen to pounce, you know what I mean? And so be merciful and and then walk humbly with the Lord, which kind of ties into being merciful. If we realize what God has done for us, the forgiveness that we have experienced, it really helps us to share that with others. So pick it up in verse 8, as we see that faith requires that we see life's issues through the lens of God. That means we look to God's fir- God first, and then, we, and then at what's going on around us. Don't get overwhelmed with the circumstances. If we look at the circumstances first, then it, it, it shrinks our view of God, and, and causes all sorts of problems. So in verse 8, once when the king of Syria was warring against Israel, he took counsel with his servants, saying, at such and such a place shall be my camp. So in other words, he, he tells his uh, uh, subordinates, here's where we're going to camp. But the man of God, Elisha, would send word to the king of Israel, the, the king of Syria's enemy, beware that you not pass this place for the Syrians are going down there. So, this is the kind of guy you want on your side, <laughs> Elisha, right, in, in this type of situation, right? You're at war, and he would basically tell the king of Israel where the enemy was going to be, so don't go that way. And so the king of Israel sent the place about which the man of God told him. Thus he used to warn him so that he saved himself more than once or twice. So many times, Elisha spared uh, a surprise attack from the king of Syria, because the king of Israel knew where he was. You can imagine after a while that would get under the skin perhaps of the king of Syria, as it does here in verse 11. The mind of the king of Syria was greatly troubled. You can understand why. Because of this thing. And he called his servants and he said to them, will you not show me who of us is for the king of Israel? In other words, where's the spy? Right? Who's telling the enemy where we're going next? And one of his servants in verse 12 says, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. So you think his mind was messed up already. Now it's like, I and mean, he even hears what you're saying in the most, you know, your most private of place. So he said, Go and see where he is that I may send and seize him. And it was told him, Behold, he is in Dothan. So he sent their horses and chariots and a great army, and they came by night and surrounded the city. So he finds out that Elisha is the one, right? It's not a spy in his own camp. There's somebody in 
the nation of Israel, Elisha, who tells the king what we're going to be. And so he says, I want to go capture this guy. So he sends these, uh, this army down. They're not, we'll find out it's not his own army. It's sort of a hired army. So when the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. So this is one of Elisha's servants, helpers. Um, and when he wakes up, he goes and he sees, oh my gosh, we're surrounded. And he said, alas, my master, what shall we do? And he, that is Elisha, says, don't be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And of course, he's not speaking physically, because uh, again, as, as we talked about, seeing through the lens of God rather than our circumstances, which is super important always, but I would suggest uniquely so perhaps here in 2020, right? So he's speaking of the armies of God. Right? Um, then Elisha prayed, and he said, Oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. Right? It's, it's so important for us to be mentally, emotionally, spiritually in tune with trusting the Lord and what God is doing. It's interesting, he didn't pray for the circumstances to change. He didn't pray to wipe out my enemies. He prayed for his servant to, you might say, understand better how big God is. Show him all those that are on our side. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And when the Syrians came down against him, so now the servant sees what he's talking about, right, these mighty armies of, of, of angel warriors are around around the camp. And so when the Syrians came down against him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, please strike this people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness in accordance with the prayer of Elisha. And Elisha said to them, this is not the way and this is not the city. Follow me and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. And he led them to Samaria. Well, Samaria is uh, not the place that an army from Syria, or on behalf of Syria, wants to be. So it's interesting. Elisha prays. God blinds her eyes. Apparently not a, a complete blindness, because they're able to uh, interact with Elisha and follow him. And, and that would be difficult if they were completely blind, all, all of them. And so, and certainly God easily could have brought confusion to their minds. But nevertheless... They, they follow uh, Elisha. Uh, and, and so he leads them to Samaria, really into the enemy's camp. And as soon as they entered Samaria, Elisha said, O Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. So the Lord opened their eyes and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. As soon as the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, my father, shall I strike them down? He's like, man, you brought me my enemies right here and you know, perfect spot for me just to take them out. And Elisha answers in verse 22, You shall not strike them down. Would you strike down those whom you have taken captive with your sword and with your bow? Set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. It's wild. Elisha says, Don't strike them down. Bless them. Right? How, how would that change things in the conversation today? Right? If, if we blessed our enemy. Right? Not, not to say we should be uh, doormats or walked on or, or, or certainly not allow people to uh, uh, harm us or harm loved ones. But um, as I mentioned earlier, it seems like every chance that so many get, they want to pounce right, and bring harm to uh, others. And, and here, Elisha says, no, no, don't strike them down, but feed them. We'll find out this is an army which was common at the time that the king had hired and sent there. And so this is going to actually be a brilliant move, as we'll see in a few minutes. Uh, set bread and water before them, that they may eat and drink and go to their master. So he prepared for them a great feast. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away. And they went to their master, and check this out, and the Syrians did not come again on raids into the land of Israel. Brilliant move. Right? So he, he basically made... You know, maybe not a friend, but at least stopped an enemy. 
right? These, these, these folks, these armies that have been hired, would never come and attack them again. Good move, right? Good move. But, but we, we see clearly that, that faith requires to see through the, us to see through the lens of God, and, and it gives a healthy perspective. I think asking ourselves, as Elisha asked the Lord to show his servant what was really going on, right? And, and to show him the truth of the battle and the victory that they were already walking in, like you and I as believers walk in presently in the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't you love that about, you know, facing 2020? We're in Christ. And it's still true that we are more than conquerors through the Lord Jesus Christ who loves us. That's still true, right? We might think, man, that's a crazy year, whatever. We're still more than conquerors. Elisha um, asked God, and God did it, showed his servant the truth of the, of the victory that they were in. In other words, what is God doing at this time? A good question for us to ask ourselves. What is God doing in this versus, oh, why is this happening to me? Right? What is God doing in your life? What does God want to do through your life in 2020 and beyond? It's going to involve, if we want to follow his will, it's going to involve others, blessing others, being a part of ministering to others. We talked about some ways to do that even digitally. Certainly a lot of ways, you know, God's provided as a church a lot of opportunities to minister to folks. It's been a great blessing uh, uh, during this time you know and and so for us as believers what is God doing in this what does God want to do in this otherwise challenging time instead of sort of lamenting the fact that it's happening there's so many great things you know we see people there, there's a lot of problems a lot of challenges no doubt and I don't dismiss those minimize those um, in fact I'm concerned that some in leadership in our, our parts of our country are, right? Uh, not taking things as the, the genuine uh, problem that they are, the threat that they could be um, or are. Uh, but at the same time, so not minimizing that, but there's a lot of, you know, response. You see, you see people coming out. I mean, during, during, as I mentioned, neighbors coming over and helping each other just in our neighborhood, cut down, uh, remove uh, broken down branches and and helping each other out and watching each other's, each other's back and helping each other uh, during no electricity times and and the response is is a blessing and that's the Lord right the Lord working in and through His people you know you think of of Katrina and now we're in the midst of another uh, aftermath I don't have the latest stats on on what the hurricane uh, down down south but you know it's interesting you know who's first on site you know in the state of Texas their go-to agency is Samaritan's Purse they call Samaritan's Purse before they call FEMA right and a Christian ministry and and of course there's a lot of folks that arrive when the cameras are there but guess who's always there after the cameras are gone the Christian church right God's doing a work and he wants to do, I believe, with all my heart uh, through this. So don't get hung up on only what we can see with our eyes, but see the bigger picture of what God is doing. The Bible in Romans chapter 8, verse 28 is still true. God truly does cause all things to work together for the good, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And we experience that by humbling ourselves and surrendering and following him. Just because we don't see the way doesn't mean that God's not making a way or that there's not a way. And then last but not least, as we continue on, uh, our first point, of course, as I mentioned, work hard to do what we can do. You know, as I mentioned, I mean, some of the stuff is physical. It's, it's hard, right? Sometimes the more difficult part can be emotional or mental. But work hard to do what you can do. 
And then trust the Lord to do what only he can do. Because guess what? He's faithful. Number two, remember that faith requires that we see these challenges and these issues through the lens of God, what God is doing, rather than through the problems themselves, right? And, and that seeing things through the lens of God gives us a more healthy perspective. And then last but not least, be patient. We'll see that here in a second. Be patient and honor God, right? Truly put God first. Perhaps there's areas of, of your life, my life, our life, our church, our communities here in central Iowa, our state, our country, that where, where God is not first, right? And we, we can't direct, you know, the way of, of, of the country, but we can direct the way of our own lives and our own decisions. What are areas that perhaps God would want to do something different in us? Be patient and honor God, right? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That means being right with him, and faith is an action word. It requires trust, right? Realize that he will see you through in the right time. In the right time. Be patient and honor God. He will see you through in the right time. Afterward, verse 24 Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, mustered his entire army, and he went up, and he besieged Samaria. And there was a famine in Samaria. They besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and the fourth part of, of a cab of dove, dove's dung for five shekels of silver. So this was a common military strategy, right, where uh, they would besiege a city, and so they did that. And it would cause great famine, and it would cause all sorts of, uh, of tragedy, Verse 26, now as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him saying, help my Lord, O king. And he said, if the Lord will not help you, how shall I help you? I mean, just, just in distress. Right? What, uh, and then the king asked her in verse 28, what is your trouble? And she answered, this woman said to me, give your son that we may eat him today and we will eat my son tomorrow. So talk about a, a, a terrible time, a terrible famine, so bad that was tragically prophesied, right, that if the people rejected the Lord, that it would come to this, and they have rejected the Lord, and now this is true, that they're, they're eating their own kids. Verse 29, so he boiled my son and ate him, and on the next day I said to her, give your son that we may eat him, but she has hidden her son. So understandably, when the king heard the words of the woman, he tore his clothes. Now he was passing by on the wall, uh, and the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth beneath on his body. And he said, May, so he, he's, he's just cut to the core, as any reasonable thinking person would be about this happening, and any reasonable thinking person would be about taking the life of any child, right, including in the womb, right? He's, he's cut to the heart. May God do so to me, and more also, if the head of Elisha, the son of uh, Shaphat, remains on his shoulders today. So what does he do? He effectively blames God. Right? It's his own rebellion, his own lack of leadership that has godly leadership that has led to this problem, and not unlike some perhaps in our country now, instead of owning it, he's blaming God. So verse 32, Elisha was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with them. Now the king had dispatched a man from his presence, but before the messenger arrived, Elisha said to the elders, do you see how this murderer has sent to take off my head? Look. When the messenger comes, shut the door and hold the door fast against him. It is not the sound of his master's feet behind him. And while he was still speaking with them, the messenger came down to him and said, The trouble is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? So these folks are giving up. right? They're blaming God and rather than seeking God. And they're giving up. Verse 1 of chapter 7 says, But Elisha responds, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Tomorrow about this time a seah of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel, and two seahs of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. Then the captain on whose hand the king leaned said to the man of God, If the Lord himself should make windows in heaven, could this thing be? So in other words, Elisha says, Tomorrow this is going to be all over. Prices are going to be back to not, not quite normal, still high, but not outrageous and not the tragic things. In other words, the siege is going to be over tomorrow. And, and, and the king's assistant, who was there, right-hand guy, says, That's impossible. If the Lord himself should make windows in heaven, could this thing be? But he said, you shall see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. So Elisha tells him, yeah, it'll happen, and you'll see it, but you're not going to get to enjoy it. 
Now there were four men who were lepers at the entrance of the gate, and they said to one another, Why are we sitting here until we die? If we say, Let us enter the city, the famine is in the city, and we'll, we'll die there. And if we sit here, we die also. So now come, let us go over to the camp of the Syrians. If they spare our lives, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. So in other words, there's lepers. They're outside of the city wall. They're separated so they don't get other people uh, leprous. And they said, look, we're going to die anyways. Uh, we're not going to be able to go in the city to, to take part in the very little bit of provision they have. We're going to die out here. So we might as well go over to the enemy and see if perhaps they'll care for us or take us in at least. And, and if they kill us, well, we're going to die anyway. So not a completely unreasonable thought. So they arose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. But when they came to the edge of the camp of the Syrians, behold, there was no one there. For the Lord had made the army of the Syrians hear the sounds of chariots and horses, the sound of a great army, so that they said to one another, Behold, the king of Israel has hired against us the king of the Hittites and the kings of Egypt to come against us. So they fled away in the twilight and abandoned their tents, their horses, their donkeys, leaving the camp as it was, and fled for their lives. And when these lepers came to the edge of the camp, they went into a tent and ate and drank, and they carried off silver and gold and clothing and went and had them. They came back and entered another tent and carried off things from it and went and hid them. So the language suggests, actually, they, they went around the camp, right, and, and came in kind of the back, less fortified site. And some suggest perhaps that it was their shuffling that the Lord magnified and made the army think that, that there was, you know, a huge army coming against them. And, uh, and so the, the army scatters. So the lepers get there and they see everything set up and they go in and they, they chow down. And they took off, they took some of the uh, provision and hid it for themselves for later. Verse 9, then they said to one another, we're not doing right. This day is a day of good news. If we are silent and wait until morning light, punishment will overtake us. Now, therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. So in other words, now we found this great blessing, this good news. Like we found the good news of Jesus Christ, right? We don't want to hide it. We don't want to keep it to ourselves only. They're, they said, let's go back and let's share this good news. So verse 10, they came and they called to the gatekeepers of the city and told them, we, we came to the camp of the Syrians. Behold, there is no one to be seen or heard there, nothing but the horses tied and the donkeys tied and the tents as they were. Then the gatekeepers called out and was told within the king's household. And the king rose in the night and said to his servants, you know, and so they, they couldn't get directly to the king, but they, they told the people at the wall who relayed it, right? They told who they could, just like we can tell the good news to who we can. And the king rose in the night and said to his servants, I'll tell you what the Syrians have done to us. They know that we are hungry, therefore they have gone out of the camp and hidden themselves in the open country, thinking, when they come out of the city, we shall take them alive and get into the city. So in other words, he thinks they're tricking them. And one of his servants said, Let some men take five of the remaining horses, seeing that those who are left here will fare like the whole multitude of Israel, who have already perished. Let us send and see. So let's go check it out, but this, uh, a few folks. Verse 14 so they took two horsemen, and the king sent them before the army of the Syrians, or after the army, rather, saying, Go and see. And so they went after them as far as the Jordan, and behold, all the way was littered with garments and equipment that the Syrians had thrown away in their haste. And the messengers returned and told the king. So it was as they, as they found, right? They, they went, and they saw the Syrians had left, and all, all that they could find left over was, you know, the stuff that they were discarding so they could run faster away. Then the people went out, and they plundered the camp of the Syrians. So a sea of fine flour was sold for a shekel, and two seahs of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord, just like uh, Elisha had predicted the day before. Now the king had appointed the captain on whose hand he leaned to have charge of the gate. So this is the guy who Elisha told, yeah, you'll see it, but you won't get to enjoy it. The people, uh, 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 verse 17, the second part of it, and the people trampled him in the gate so that he died, as the man of God had said. When the king came down to him, for when the man of God had said to the king, two seahs of barley shall be sold for a shekel, and a seah of fine flour for a shekel, about this time tomorrow in the gate of Samaria, the captain had answered the man of God, if the Lord himself should make windows in heaven, could such a thing be? And he had said, you shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. And so it happened to him, for the people trampled him in the gate, and he died. So just as the Lord uh, predicted, right, it came to pass. This guy doubted and ends up being very, very costly for him. So they were patient, but not patient long enough. They waited, but they didn't wait long enough. 
How many times in our life do we miss out because we give up? How many times in our life do we think, I've waited long enough, I've prayed hard enough, I've tried enough, I'm done, I'm going to give up. You know, maybe, maybe it's uh, uh, somebody you're trying to reach, maybe it's a, a personal goal in your life, maybe it's on a relationship, maybe it's some medical condition, maybe it's a financial situation, maybe it's a ministry opportunity, you name it. How often have we given up or are we tempted to give up uh, too soon? So don't forget uh, to uh, be patient and to honor God. He'll see us through in the right time. Right? And when he does, then don't forget to give thanks right, and to give him glory uh, for that. In the meantime, keep on doing the right thing. Right? This idea of eating their kids and a lot of the things that were going on, clearly not the right thing to do. You know, don't, don't despair to the point of doing wrong even when things are challenging. Keep our eyes on Jesus, right? Honor God, be faithful to Him. And, um, you know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, the first five verses, we won't turn there for time's sake, but we read about the responsibility of a steward. We've all been given responsibility. We've all been given a stewardship. And the Bible teaches us that it is required of us as stewards to be found faithful to whatever God has called us to. Right? And whether that it appears to be small or large, very simply, be faithful in all things, draw near to the Lord, and enjoy Him. Right? I think if we follow these uh, principles we see here in God's Word, we can not only survive 2020, but we can thrive. I don't know about you, but I, I you know, you hear some talk of like 2020 almost being a wasted year. I hope that's not the case for us. Right, that, that we allow 2020 to be a year of personal growth, uh, of growth in our relationship with the Lord, and strengthening in areas that we otherwise might not even have considered were it not for some of the difficulties. Sometimes out of great challenge comes great victory, com comes great strengthening. So let's allow the Lord to do that in our lives. Amen? Let's stand and we'll close in prayer. I want to remind you, if, if you haven't already, uh, subscribe to the YouTube page and click on the notifications and get all notifications. Thanks so much for joining us today in our study. Hope you were blessed and encouraged in the love that God has for you. Hope you found, you know, two or three nuggets that you can take away and apply to your life because God has great plans for you and those plans are found through surrender and obedience to what He has for us. I encourage you to dive further into the Word uh, spend time in prayer and in fellowship. I want to personally invite you out to Calvary Chapel Living Hope here in West Des Moines. If you're in the greater Des Moines area, I'd love to have you join us in person. Uh, we meet at 9.30 a.m. at 3635 E.P. Tree Parkway. Of course, if you're out of the area, thrilled to have you join us online at our Facebook live stream every Sunday morning or through YouTube by subscribing to YouTube channel for Calvary Chapel Living Hope here in Iowa. Thanks so much for joining us. You are loved. Hope you are blessed. God bless you.